Hey everyone, Jim Branscombe here, back once again with another episode of In the Mouth of Cinema Madness. I don't know why I'm compelled to do this voice when I say that, but you know, here we are. This is a sub-series of the Cinematic Void vlog where I basically talk about the movies that had a huge influence on me, you know, growing up, going to college, you know, everything that went in these eyeballs and infected my brain and eventually made Cinematic Void happen. The movie I'm talking about today is kind of a follow-up to the first episode, which was Night of the Living Dead. I'm going to be talking about George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead. In 1968, George Romero brought us Night of the Living Dead. It became the classic horror film of its time. Now, George Romero brings us the most intensely shocking motion picture experience for all times. Dawn of the Dead. Night of the Living Dead has ended. Dawn of the Dead is here. Now, this was a huge movie for me. Huge, huge, huge. And... I remember after I saw Night of the Living Dead and I started getting other horror movies, like number one on my list was to see Dawn of the Dead. And incidentally enough, it had just been re-released on VHS by Anchor Bay. I remember it had this purple cover and I got it at, you guessed it, Kmart. When you see our new Kmart sign outside, I like that new logo. The new Kmarts have wider aisles, new lighting, and new displays of the best brand names faster checkouts, and a new attitude toward service. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. We understand you want to feel good about where you shop. And I promise you, you're going to love your new Kmart. Not sure why Kmart was stocking all these re-releases of horror classics, but I sure appreciate it. So the tape was labeled as the director's cut, which I thought meant more gore. And I guess there's a little more gore in it, but what this really was was the Cannes Film Festival cut. This was a version they showed at the Cannes Film Festival, and they made a couple of trims and kind of tightened things up for the U.S. theatrical release. But this was the first time I saw Dawn of the Dead was on this tape. And I remember that it was also labeled that it was widescreen and had all these extras. It wasn't. It was a two-tape set, and they actually split the movie up between the two tapes. And also, it was open mat, which is they just took the black bars on the top and the bottom where it would be letterbox. So it just filled the 4x3 frame. I'm not sure if that was a print error or if they fixed it at any point, but I didn't care because I owned a copy of Dawn of the Dead. And once I popped that tape in, I was just in love with the movie. This was kind of the movie that I had been searching for at the time. I had seen some other horror movies, but this I really connected with. Although I had originally been afraid of zombies, see the Night of the Living Dead episode, now zombies have become my favorite subgenre of horror. Anything with a zombie, I was watching it, and Dawn of the Dead was just, nothing could beat it. It had action, it had gore, it had really cool characters, it just, it was a perfect movie for me, and I was obsessed with it. I know I've said obsessed many times over these episodes, but when you get into cult cinema, and the reason why you get in cult cinema is because you're obsessed. I would watch this tape multiple times a week, and this would go on for years, and I would find any excuse to watch this tape. If I went over to someone's house, like, hey, you ever seen Dawn of the Dead? I'd make them watch Dawn of the Dead. I just couldn't get enough of this movie. And because, again, like Night of the Living Dead, where, you know, obviously lower budget, you could see some of the nuts and bolts behind it, but it was just really inspiring. It was, Night of the Living Dead was the movie that made me want to make films. Dawn of the Dead kind of like pushed me like, you gotta do this because it's just like, I want to make shit like this. I don't think I would have been capable of making anything as good as Dawn of the Dead, but you know, when you're in your teens and you're naive, you, you think you can do that kind of stuff. As I was learning more about George Romero and his films, I discovered that, you know, he had made most of them in Pittsburgh. And living just half an hour outside of Baltimore, I was from a town called Aberdeen, Maryland, best known for being the hometown of Cal Ripken Jr., famous baseball player. As a shortstop, I know a lot about double plays, like the Track Auto Orioles $100,000 double play sweepstakes. And his brother, Billy Fuckface Ripken, which, you know, was a very infamous baseball card growing up. If you got a copy of it, you were the coolest kid, pretty much. But Pittsburgh was only a six to seven hour drive away. And I was like, I wanna go to the mall from Dawn of the Dead because I knew it was a real mall. It was in Monroeville, Pennsylvania, which was just outside of Pittsburgh. I forget exactly which way, if it was in front, behind, whatever. It's, it's near Pittsburgh. <laughs> fashion-minded, watch out. 
Big time shopping is finally here, Monroeville Mall. So in the year 2000, when I was in college, I talked to my friend Jim DeHaven, who, you know, I met in the eighth grade because we bonded over Evil Dead 2, so we would always talk movies, music, and stuff like that. And we were like, we should go on a road trip to the Monroeville Mall and see the place where they shot Dawn of the Dead. And we kept talking about it, we were like, yeah, we're gonna do this. So we actually planned out this road trip. And we were both under 21 at the time, so we had another mutual friend of ours, Jess Morgan, who was over 21. He bought some beer for the trip and some other alcohol and stuff so we could party or whatever. I think Jess really took the piss out of both of us because he got his Corona light. So we actually made the six hour drive up to Monroeville. We stayed at like a day's end or something that was like right across the street from the mall. So we couldn't miss any of that mall action. And when we weren't at the mall, we sat in our hotel room and we drank Corona light beers, which is not a great beer. Also, they were not twist tops. We needed a bottle opener and neither of us was smart enough to bring one. And when we went to the mall to find one, we couldn't find a store that sold a bottle opener. So we ended up having to take the beer bottles on the side of the air conditioner in the hotel room, pop them that way. So that's how we drank those shitty Corona lights. But going to the actual mall was really just insane because this was the first time I had knowingly went to a filming location. And in the year 2000, a lot had changed at Monroeville Mall, but we brought like one of those disposal cameras and I took some pictures, but things like the ice skating rink and the fountain were already gone, but JC Penney's was still there, all the stairwells and escalators were still there, and of course the elevator was still there. So we just kind of ran around the mall taking photos like an idiot and I'm sure everyone's like what the hell's going on because this was at a time where people weren't really doing that kind of stuff. Now if you go to the Monroeville Mall there's actually a George Romero tribute plaque and I think there's a zombie museum in the mall so it's way different than when I went in the year 2000. But you know we just ran around and just like couldn't believe we were in a place where one of our favorite movies was shot. For a while Dawn of the Dead became kind of a white whale of a movie that I wanted to see on the big screen. It just never played and I found out there's some reasons why and if you want to go look them up on the internet you can find out why it was very hard to see a screening of Dawn of the Dead. In 2018 I had made a pitch to the American Cinematheque who I do cinematic void through to do a Black Friday screening of Dawn of the Dead. We had a couple of years before that shown the 3D version of Dawn of the Dead and we had Richard P. Rubenstein who was the producer of the film out and we just kind of wanted to see if we could do another screening and Richard approved of it. We had to show the 3D version and I ended up teaming with Christian Parks from Beyond Fest and we presented the screening down in the Aero Theater in Santa Monica and we got Greg Nicotero, very famous special effects artist, part of K&B. You know, he didn't work on Dawn of the Dead but he was great friends with George Romero. He worked on Tom Savini's effects team for Day of the Dead and he also did the effects for Land of the Dead. So he had a long history with George Romero. And Greg Nicotero was kind enough to come out and talk about working with George and like all of his knowledge of Dawn of the Dead and all the zombie stuff and it was a really really cool conversation. That Dawn of the Dead screen was really really great and then in 2021 post lockdown of the pandemic we decided to do another Black Friday screen Dawn of the Dead but this time we got one of the stars out from the movie, Ken Foray. Ken came out, he gave a 90 minute Q&A, he talked about, you know, not just Dawn of the Dead, but like his career overall, what he's working on now, and it was really a blast, and I had a great time hanging with Ken and hearing like other stories that, you know, weren't told during the Q&A, but just, Ken's a guy who loves movies and he just loves being in a movie theater and experiencing that with an audience. So it's really cool to go from basically buying a VHS of Dawn of the Dead at Kmart and then getting the screen at the Aero Theater in Santa Monica with one of the stars and one of the greatest special effects artists that ever do it. So that wraps up this episode of In the Mouth of Cinematis. When was the first time you saw Dawn of the Dead? Sound off in the comments below, and until next time, see you in the void. Again, I don't know why I'm doing that voice. When there's no more room in hell, 
the dead will walk here.